and he was blinded by God and when he was blinded by God he was told by God or I'm sorry he asked you know, who is this that's you know just blind me or who is this that has knocked me down this is Jesus who you've been persecuting do you think his faith increased you think he developed some faith but understand it was through his trial that his faith was developed it was through his trial where his faith was was manifested at a higher level because he was actually spoken to by God and began given this blindness now God told him now this please bear with me for a minute um, let me see how many more I have one two three four one two three okay after the next one I'm almost done can you imagine please bear with me just a moment Paul is on his way he is and, and believe me he thought he was doing the right thing he was a Pharisee and he was doing what he religiously thought was the right thing to kill Christians who were supposedly uh, in his mind and in their minds doing wrong against the true God and he was actually he called himself later on when he became the writer of two-thirds of the New Testament he said of sinners I am chief I'm worse than all of you people now a lot of people have translated that to saying that he would say he's a sinner right now when he was saying it after he converted which he wasn't unfortunately people have mistranslated that and then go ahead and living lives of sin saying well Paul said he was a sinner that's not what he meant what he meant was I was a worse sinner than all you people because I actually killed the children of God now imagine with me for a second Paul who was Saul and, and to become Paul the same man who was going around killing God's children was then told by God you my friend are going to be my minister Wow you who is a murderer just because he thought he was doing it in the name of God does not make it okay he committed murder he murdered people and put him in jail I'm sure had him vote torture involved and all that stuff and to be looked at by God can you imagine what he felt like the level of grace that was put on him to be allowed to be a minister of God and it was right away he didn't say later he said right now you are going to be my minister now go on your way and do what it said deliver thee from the people unto the Gentiles unto whom I will send thee to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light from the power of Satan unto God and they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me <clears throat> sometimes our trials should give us more faith when God forgives you when God uses you you know this man committed murder I made some mistakes in my life and there are people that are telling me that, that, that I shouldn't have been a pastor or I should enter into the ministry because of my past mistakes and I didn't kill nobody <laughs> I've never killed one person in my life I can promise you that so you better believe of this man who was called Saul which was a murderer not just of any people but of God's children can be used of God that me or any of you whatever mistakes you've made in your life can be used of God does that make sense to you now in order to believe that you can be used of God despite of your frailties and your your mistakes and your impurities and your iniquities you need to have what you need to have faith you need to have faith that God can forgive you, that God loves you, that God is going to use you. Uh, Sister Anita, how long were you in church before you started bringing people to church? Who, did you bring anybody to church or was that you? You were brought by her. I'm sorry. Wrong person. Excuse me. Uh, how long were you in this place before you brought Anita? About six months? Sister, how long was it you were in this church before you brought all the people you brought? You brought the Johnsons? About six months? 
you know, some people think that they have to be, you know, trained and you have to go to seminary school and you have to, you know, be put under somebody and all. Listen, God can use you right now. The only, re there is a prerequisite, I mean, to be used to really bring someone. I mean, remember Paul, he was told he was going to be used, but what's the first thing he did? He went and re he got repented that moment. Then what did he do? He went to go see Ananias and what did Ananias do to, to Paul? He baptized him. And what had happened when he got baptized or sometime in that realm, he got what? He got the Holy Ghost. So the only prerequisite really to be used of God is to do those things and God will use you immediately. He will use you if you will allow yourself to be used. But you've got to have faith that he can do it. And when we come to church, we think we're these dirty, rotten scoundrels that, oh no, God can never use me. Look at all, all the things I've done, all the mistakes I've made. That's a lie from the devil. Anybody in this room right now, with whatever testimony you have right now, can go and bring someone to church. And say, you know what, there's a place where you can feel the presence of God. There's a place where God will wash away your sins. There's a place where he'll come down on you and you'll feel God's love. We shout and we jump and we dance for the Lord. You might like it. Come on and see. You don't have to be perfect to witness to somebody. You, I mean, Paul started delivering the message immediately. But we got to have faith. Isn't it amazing all the things that faith will do? It'll get us saved. As long as we add it with works. It'll get, let us be used by God. It'll give us comfort. Strength. It gives us the ability to be immovable in God. It'll give us, it can give us some, some guarantee that if we'll stay in the faith, that we'll stay in God. Do you realize now why I've been preaching it for so long? <laughs> and I've still got a few more messages to go on faith. But this is how I'm put, this is, we're, we're building a block here. We're building a house from blocks. And we're, we're, we're laying down the concrete right now. And if we could start with these basic premises, when that, what does it say about the house that's built on sand? What's going to happen to it when the storm comes? It's the, man, the water and the wind is going to blow that sand away and the house is going to come tumbling down. But if you build your foundation on the solid rock, how about the rock of the foundation on Jesus? If you build that foundation on concrete, no how much water comes, your house is going to stand. I love the Word of God. To me it is so, it is so profound. We need to have the foundation of faith. And we can build on faith. Because what happens after you have faith? You'll repent. Because if you don't have faith, you will not repent. For what? Why would you do that? If you don't have faith, you won't get baptized in Jesus' name unless you're just trying to impress someone. And I'm not looking to baptize anybody just because they're trying to impress their girlfriend or their mom or their dad. That's not what baptism is for. Baptism is for the remission of sins according to the Word of God in Acts 2.38 and Acts 22.16. It's a part of your salvation according to first, uh, 2 Peter 1.20. No, 1 Peter 3.21 says God doth also now save us. It's a part of your salvation but you got to have faith to do it. You will not receive the Holy Ghost unless you have faith that God can fill you with the Holy Ghost. That's part of my six steps of receiving the Holy Ghost. One of them is faith. You have to be repentant, you have to have faith, you have to have, you have to believe that God can do it. Verbal worship, focus, Submission. Is that six? Yes. Last step is submission. Verbal worship. I th did I say that already? Good. I don't do them in order. I just do them as I'm preaching. So I get them out of order. If you don't have faith, then you will not believe that God can comfort you in your time of trial. So when that trial comes, you will be discombobulated. That's why we pray for an increase of faith. Because what a wonderful life we can live if no matter what happens to us, we can be like, I'm alright. I'm alright. I'm okay. I'm gonna make it. But you know what's great? Is we can stand strong and be strong for our families and for our friends and for, for a church family. And we can stand strong, but we can still come to Jesus when we're feeling that insecurity and give it all to Him. 
That happened to me the other day. I, I, don't, I don't remember if I actually said it to you. I said it to the group on Friday for Bible study. But, you know, through my trial, I know how to do this. I'm going to be strong. No one's taking me out. I've got God. He is my salvation. He is my power. I'm a knight in God's army. I'm all right. And I've got that. I know how to do that. I, I look tough. Want some? But you know what? I can, be re I can have that real tough exterior and I can be strong. And... But you know, the truth is, I'm very sensitive. My mom told me that the other day. I'm learning things from, I've got some people who are not in church. But I've actually been learning, I've got three things that I've learned from, from people outside of church that have been profound. The first one I learned from Ivan. You know Ivan, and some of you know Ivan. We work with him. He does a AA house that has, houses people and, and he has meetings and we work together to get, get people a place to stay and help them come to church. He told me, you know, if you don't have expectation on what people should do, when they don't meet your expectation, you don't, you don't worry about it. If you don't expect some, if you don't expect someone to do it, then when it, when it doesn't go the way you'd like, it's really easy to deal with. And you know what? I have high expectations of people. I want you guys to make it. I want you guys to live godly. I want you to read your Bibles, pray, get, get close to God. I've got high expectations. But what tends to happen, this is my sensitivity, is when it doesn't happen, I get hurt because I, I love you so much as saints of this church that it hurts me when you don't make it. When people don't make it, I'm like, oh. And sometimes I get frustrated and aggro. I put so much time and effort and energy in someone. That's normal for any pastor. I know a pastor who put a lot of energy in me and when I left he was very disturbed by it. And some of that's very understandable. But when God calls you, God calls you. And if some people aren't going to make it, some people aren't going to make it. And so if I get all wound up over people because of my expectation that just messes me all up and wastes my energy. That was great advice that I got from that guy. Another one, somebody told me, you know what, and I have said this before, you know, he said, man, you've just had so many dysfunctional people around you. As I go through the list of all the people who are attacking me all at once. And they're all dysfunctional. These people got problems, man, I'm telling you. And it's very clearly seen. And he's just like, wow. Those, those people you've had around you are so dysfunctional. And it really like, like, a, like a, a beacon, you know. Like, like a sign that lights up. You know what that tells me? That when I see dysfunction in someone around me, that I need to back off. Because I don't need dysfunctional people around me. I got a guy just now, he came all the way from Albuquerque, called me up and he's got some really wild ideas about what God is. I call it hyper-spiritual, but I know I can help him. I've done it before. There was a guy who came uh, to the church I was in before and thought he was called to do all these crazy things. And we told him, you know what, you need to stay in church. You need to get a pastor. I said, you need to go on to this pastor right here, stay here for six months. That's what God told me to do. I actually reversed it on him. The hyper spirit said, God told me you're supposed to stay here. He was like, really? <laughs> like, yeah. Now he's a licensed minister. He's married. He's got kids. And he's stable. He's, he couldn't stay in a room with a bunch of people without running out the door. And now he's strong. So when I met this guy who's got all these kooky things, I know I can help him, but he has to be willing. So I said, come on down here. I'll get you a place to stay and I'll help you out. Well, I'll, I'll train you on how to be the, a minister that would be very, very effective. And as soon as he got here, he started acting kooky and says, God really called me to go to the ocean. And I said, well, I'm not taking you to the ocean. I'm not paying for you to go to the ocean. <laughs> if you want to be here, I'll train you and minister to you. But if you want to go to the ocean, you're going to have to talk to somebody else. And then he kept calling me for a lot of different things. Listen, I, I told him the deal. You come here, I'll get you a place to stay, and I'll train you. Anything else I'm not a part of, I'm not interested in. And today, you know what I did? I told him it's best that you not call me anymore. And you can say, well, pastor, isn't that mean? Aren't you just, you know, let it, kicking him to the curb? No, I'm not. I made a deal with him. He's the one that stepped out of the deal. So if he wants to do his own thing, he's a grown man, and he can do whatever he wants. And guess what? Because of what the other guy told me, not to be, you know, upset or have, uh, have over expectations of someone, it didn't bother me a bit to do that. And he was kind of dysfunctional. I don't need dysfunctional people around me. Now, the other thing I learned... Is, you know, I have this tough exterior, man. I, I'm strong. I, I work out. I'm not as flabby as I used to be. I mean, I was, I shook my arms in the mirror. It was like, like water, man. I was, that's gross. So I said, that's where I draw the line. And, you know, it's, it's bad enough. I have to hold at the time my shoes. 
But the, the wobbly arms, no. I go to the gym. I run. I'm strong. 